The recent carbon tracker report set out for each financial sector across the world its exposure to stranded assets, over one trillion in total. Will the COP president be engaging with each of the heads of the financial uh, sectors like the Securities and Exchange Commission, the London Stock Exchange, to ensure that they cope with that problem? Well, Mr Speaker, the, the private sector is actually very focused on the issue of uh, uh, the move to net zero. And as you will know, in Glasgow, $130 trillion of assets signed up to net zero. Uh, anyone investing uh, in, in assets which might end up being stranded has to be very clear about the financial decisions they're taking. Jerome, may you? Does my right hand agree that establishing a price for carbon would give the free market the signal it needs to invest in low carbon alternatives across the economy? Does he also agree that a carbon border adjustment mechanism is a necessary first step to achieve that? Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know my honourable friend uh, has raised this issue before, um, and of course, tackling carbon leakage is a vital issue. As my, as my honourable friend is aware, Her Majesty's Treasury will be launching a consultation later this year and setting out a range of carbon leakage mitigation options, which includes looking at a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Barry Sherman. Am I allowed to say to the Minister that many of us on these benches think he has done a darn good job? Yeah. Uh, but will he make every effort, if he survives, the present wranglings in the Conservative Party, will he come back and grassroot what we're trying to do about climate change in every community and every town and city and community? Let's have 500 sustainable towns and cities in this country. Does he agree with that? Mr Speaker, in the words of Gloria Gaynor, I will survive. Um, but can, I, can, I, can I just say, Mr Speaker, that the point he raises is that Tackling the climate emergency is an issue for all of us, for governments, for civil society and individuals, and we all need to play our part. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I'd like to point out the British Sign Language interpretation of proceedings is available to watch on the Parliament Live TV. I'd also like to welcome Lord Mackay, who is retiring today after many distinguished years as Lord Chancellor. Before I call Kim Labita to ask the first question, it's only fitting. Before I call Kim Labita, it's to ask her first question. It's only fitting to note this is likely to be the final time the right rule member for Uxbridge addresses the House as Prime Minister. I would, I would like to wish him and his family all the best for the future. Can I, can I say, we have been through many dark times within this House, and none more so than through the pandemic, and always will be remembered for what this House did and the way that you conducted those duties during those dark times. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. I understand that members will have differing views about the Prime Minister's performance and legacy, and those views will be sincerely and passionately held, but I remind members that our constituents and others around the world watch these proceedings. Let us conduct them in a respectful manner, focusing on issues and policies rather than personalities. I, remember, I take this opportunity to remind members of the words of Erskine May. Good temper and moderation are the characteristics of the parliamentary debate. I expect to see that reflected today in the proceedings. I now call Kim Ledbeater. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today marks the 40th anniversary of the bombings in Hyde Park and Regent Park, and uh, tomorrow sees the 50th anniversary of Bloody Friday. Such terror by the provisional IRA was barbaric and shameful, bringing untold grief to countless families, and our thoughts are with all those who lost loved ones during the Troubles. We as a government remain determined to help build a better shared future for all the people of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I have spoken to the Chair of the National Fire Council uh, last night and this morning about the heroic work of firefighters in recent days. I know the whole House will want to thank them and all our frontline services who have been working hard to keep us safe. Yeah. 
My right hon. Friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, will be making an oral statement later. Mr Speaker, I know colleagues will wish to join me in wishing England's Lionesses well in their quarter-final match against Spain in Brighton this evening. And I know that the House will want to congratulate Jake Whiteman, uh, who produced a stunning run to take gold in the 1500 metres at the World Championships in Oregon. Mr Speaker, as you rightly say, last week I, I told the House that this was possibly, uh, that last week was possibly my last PMQs. Uh, this uh, week, Mr Speaker, probably, certainly, uh, will be. <laughs> my last PMQs from this dispatch box, uh, uh, or any other dispatch box. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I will have further such meetings later today. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Summer recess gives all parliamentarians an opportunity to reflect on our ability to uphold the seven principles of public life. Mm. Selflessness, openness, objectivity, honesty, integrity, accountability and leadership. These are fine principles, but public trust in politicians is at an all-time low. Yep. Will the Prime Minister be using the next few weeks to personally consider why this could be? And as the unedifying fight for his job continues, if those who are vying to replace him were to draw on his wise counsel, if those who are vying to replace him would draw on his wise counsel, and why wouldn't they? What advice would he give to ensure the people we serve receive far better than they have from this government? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid I, I didn't quite catch the last uh, bit of the uh, honourable lady's question. But I, I, will be using, I will be using the next few weeks to do what I think the, uh, the people of this country would expect, and that is drive forward uh, the agenda on which we were uh, elected in, in 2019, and uh, of which I think the Labour Party particularly fear the Conservative Party. And that is the agenda, and that is the agenda of uniting and levelling up and making sure that we invest in places that for decades were betrayed by Labour and left behind. And that is what the Conservatives are going to do, and that's why we're going to win again. Russia's war in Ukraine continues. Now, Turkey have withdrawn its opposition to Sweden and Finland joining NATO. So what assessment does my right honourable friend make about the short and long-term securities of Europe now this has happened? Prime Minister. I, th I thank my honourable friend for that uh, excellent question. The accession of both countries, I think, will uh, be good for them. I think it will encourage, uh, it, will, it will make all our allies safer, and I think it will make the whole of the uh, Euro Atlantic uh, security area uh, stronger, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm proud of the role that the UK has played in that accession. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Can I start by saying to the Prime Minister that I do know that the relationship between a Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition is never easy, and this one's proved no exception to the rule. But I would like to take this opportunity to wish him, his wife and his family the best for the future. Yeah. Can I also put on record our gratitude to the Fire and Rescue Services for all their courageous work yesterday in extreme temperatures. All our thoughts are with those affected by the fires, particularly those that have lost their homes. I join the Prime Minister in his comments about the bombings in Hyde Park and the IRA bombings. I also join him in his comments about the Lionesses. The coverage starts at 7.30 tonight on BBC One, and I'm sure the whole country will be roaring them on. And for anyone who doesn't fancy football, EastEnders is on. So if you'd rather watch outrageous characters taking lumps out of it themselves, you've got a choice. Albert Square or the Tory leadership debates on catch-up. Uh, on that topic, Mr Speaker, why, why does the Prime Minister think that those vying to replace him decided to pull out of the Sky debate last night? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, 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 I'm not following this thing particularly closely, but my, my, 
my, my, my, impression, my impression is that there has been a quite a lot of debate already, and I think the public, I think the public are, are having, they're having an ample opportunity to view the talent, uh, Mr. Speaker. That, uh, any one of any one of which. Any one of which, as I say before, like some household detergent, would wipe the floor. I mean, this t- today, today is, happens to be just about the anniversary of, of the exit from lockdown last year. And do you remember? Do you remember what he said? Uh, he said, "Yeah, oh, I'm going to remind him." He said it was reckless. It was because we were able to take that decision, Mr. Speaker, supported by every single one of those Conservative candidates, opposed by him, that we had the fastest economic growth in the G7. We're now able to help families up and down the country. If we'd listened to him, it wouldn't have been possible, Mr. Speaker. And I don't think they'll be listening to him either. Well, I'm impressed he managed to get through that with a straight face, actually. Um, I think the truth is this. They organised the TV debates because they thought it would be a great chance for the public to hear from the candidates first hand. Then disaster struck because the public actually heard from the candidates (laughs) first hand. But but I am interested uh, in what he makes of the battle for his job. So let me start with a simple one. Does the Prime Minister agree with his former Chancellor that plans put forward by the other candidates are, in his words, I've got them here, nothing more than the fantasy economics of unfunded spending promises? Well, 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 Mr Speaker, they know all about fantasy economics because uh, they they committed already already committed to £94 billion of extra tax and uh, and spending, uh, Mr Speaker, which every household in this country would have to pay for to the tune of about £2,100. It's thanks to the the former Chancellor's management of the economy, thanks to this government's management of the economy, we had growth in May of 0.5%. We have more people uh, in paid employment than at any time in the history of this country, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I leave, I'm, I'm proud to be leaving office right now with unemployment at or near a 50-year low, Mr Speaker. When, when they left office, it was at 8%. That's the difference between them and us. Mr Speaker, every Labour pledge made under my leadership is fully costed. Those buying, those buying to protect him... Mr Speaker, those vying to replace him have racked up £330 billion of unfunded spending commitments. But I do note that the Prime Minister didn't agree with his former Chancellor. So what about his Foreign Secretary? She was withering about the government's economic record. She said, again her words, here they are, If Rishi has got this great plan for growth, why haven't we seen it in the last two and a half years at the Treasury? That's a fair question, is it, Prime Minister? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think everybody would uh, uh, agree that what you saw in the last two and a half years was because of the pandemic, the biggest fall in output uh, for biggest fall in output for three hundred years, which this government dealt with and, and coped with magnificently. By, by distributing vaccines faster than any other European government, faster than any other major economy, which would not have been possible if we had listened to him. And that's why, Mr Speaker, we have the fiscal firepower that is necessary to help families up and down the country, making tax cuts for virtually everybody paying national insurance contributions. Uh, the, the difference between La- Labour and the Conservatives, Mr Speaker, uh, there's a crucial philosophical difference. Under Labour, families on low incomes get most of their income from benefits. Under us, they get most of it from earnings. Because we believe in jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the difference, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, inflation is up again this morning, and millions are struggling with the cost of living crisis. And he, he's decided to come down from his gold wallpapered bunker for one last time to tell us that everything is fine. I am going to miss the delusion. But his Foreign Secretary didn't stop there, Mr Speaker. She also said that the former Chancellor's 15 tax rises are leading the country into recession. And the member for Portsmouth North was even more scathing. She said, again her words, 
our public services are in a desperate state. Yeah. We can't continue with what we've been doing because it clearly isn't working. Yeah. Has the Prime Minister told her who's been running our public services for the last 12 years? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, this is absolute. Again, he's doing this completely satirical. This is the government. This is the government that is investing £650 billion pounds, uh, in infrastructure, in skills, in technology. He talks about public services. What really matters to people in this country right now is getting their, getting their appointments, getting their operations, fixing the COVID backlogs. That's what we're doing, fixing the ambulances. That's what he should be talking about, Mr Speaker. And, and that's why we voted through. That's why we passed the £39 billion pound health and care levy, Mr Speaker, which they opposed. What, every time something needs to be done, Done, Mr. Speaker, they try to oppose it. Now, he's just a great pointless human bollard, Mr. Speaker. That's what he is. Mr. Mr. Speaker, if only, if only it was satirical. It's what the future candidates think of his, Mr. Speaker. We want to get through PMQs because there's quite a few of you wanting to catch my eye. It would be more helpful if we get through in order to do that. Keir Starmer. I appreciate they may not want to hear what their future leader thinks of their record in government, but I think the country needs to know. If only it were satirical, Prime Minister. It's what the candidates think of the record. Yeah. Yeah. But among the mudslinging, there was one very important point, because the member for Saffron Walden claimed that she warned the former Chancellor mm. that he was handing taxpayer money directly yeah. to fraudsters in yeah. COVID loans. She says he dismissed her worries and that, as a result, he cost the taxpayer £17 billion. Pounds. Does the Prime Minister think that she's telling the truth? Prime yeah. Minister. OK, well, this is the, one of the last blasts from Captain Hindsight, uh, Mr Speaker, because... At least, to, at least to me, uh, at least to me, because because they were the party. I remember they were the party who was who were so so desperate uh, for us to be uh, hiring their friends with to get to with PPE. They wanted a football agent uh, to supply and a theatrical costumia uh, to supply PPE. Do you remember, Mr. Mr. Speaker? We ha we had to get that stuff at record speed. Uh, we produced 408 billion pounds worth of support uh, for families and for businesses up and down the country. Mr. Speaker, and the only reason we were able to do it at, at such speed is because we'd managed the economy in a sensible and moderate way. And Labour, every time they've left office, it's with unemployment higher, they're economically illiterate, Mr. Speaker, and they would wreck the economy. I think the message coming out of this leadership contest is pretty clear. They got us into this mess, and they've no idea how to get us out of it. The Foreign Secretary says we can't go on with our current economic policy. Yeah. The member for Portsmouth North bemoaned the fact that what we've been doing has not been good enough. Yeah. And the member for Saffron Walden probably puts it best when she simply asked, why should the public trust us? We haven't exactly covered ourselves in glory. Yeah. Their words, their future leaders' words. They've trashed every part of their record in government, yeah. from dental care and ambulance response times to the highest taxes in 70 years. Yeah. What message does it send when the candidates to be Prime Minister can't find a single decent thing to say about him, about each other, or their record in government? Yeah. Mr Speaker, what does it say? What does it, what does it say about him? But no one can name a single policy of the late, after three years of the Labour opposition apart from putting up taxes. He's one of those pointless plastic bollards you find uh, around, a, around a deserted roadworks on a motorway, Mr Speaker. Uh, we got Brexit done. He voted against it 48 times. We got this country passed out of Covid in spite of everything uh, he would have kept and when he would have kept us in lockdown. We're fixing social care, Mr Speaker, when they have no plan and no ideas of their own. And we're now bringing forward measures with, in the face of strikes, to outlaw wildcat strikes, Mr. Speaker, uh, I can tell you to outlaw wildcat strikes. I can tell you why. I can tell you why he does that that funny wooden <laughs> flapping gesture. I tell you why he does that funny wooden flapping gesture. Because, Mr. Speaker, he's got he's a, he's got the union barons pulling his strings from beneath him. That's the truth. 
million pounds, Mr. Speaker. We've restored our democracy and our independence. Uh, we've got this country through COVID, and I'm proud to say that whether it comes to tackling climate change or sticking up for Ukraine, we have led the world on the international stage. And I want to thank my friends and colleagues on these benches for everything that they have done. Roberts. Mr. Speaker, in, in September it will be 25 years since the anniversary. A 25th anniversary of the referendum on devolution in both Scotland and Wales. One in 20 people in England and the NHS have been waiting for, for more than a year. In Wales, that's one in five. And school leaders in Wales, 75% of whom say that they don't have enough capital to maintain their existing buildings, regardless of building any others. In his final opportunity at the dispatch box, will the Prime Minister and the Minister for the Union agree? that in terms of Wales at least, devolution has been a disaster. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want devolution to, to work, but I think, and I've had some good conversations with Mark Drayford, uh, but the devolved authorities, particularly Labour in Wales, need to do their job properly. Yeah. Now comes to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I join you in wishing all the best in his impending retirement to... James Mackay and Beth. He has been a friend to many of us right throughout this House, and we congratulate him for his service. Can I also join the Prime Minister in congratulating uh, Jake uh, Whiteman for his success overnight in winning the 1500 metres at the World Champions? What a fantastic achievement. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this week has seen historic records set across the United Kingdom. But let us look at the Prime Minister's record breaking efforts in office. His Tory Brexit slashed £31 billion from the economy, the biggest fall in living standards since the 1970s, people's pay in real terms falling at the fastest rate on record, with the worst economic growth forecast in the G20 outside Russia, and the highest inflation in 40 years. Personally, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister, in his capacity as Minister of the Union, for driving support for independence to new heights. Mr Speaker, Westminster is holding Scotland back. The economy is failing and this Prime Minister has driven us to the brink of a recession. Isn't it the case that the Prime Minister's legacy of catastrophic mismanagement has paved the way for the end of the Union? Uh, Mr Speaker, that's not what I uh, observe. And he talks about records. I'll point to the, the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, lowest unemployment, as I said, uh, for uh, at or near 50 years, the lowest youth unemployment, fastest growth in the G7 uh, last year, in spite of everything. That, that's for the Scottish uh, national, nationalist record. Just look at, look at where, uh, where, where they are. They're, I'm afraid to say Scottish uh, school standards are not what they should be because of the failure uh, of the SNP. Uh, they're, failing, they're, failing, they're failing people uh, who are tragically addicted, addicted to drugs, uh, Mr Speaker, in Scotland. And the people of Scotland are facing another £900 million in tax because of the mismanagement of the SNP. I mean, the, the Prime Minister might believe that nonsense, but the people of Scotland don't because they know the reality that our NHS is the best performing in the United Kingdom and education standards under the SNP are moving in the right direction. Mr Speaker, that's a, that's a good look to the people of Scotland, the disdain that the Tories show for our country. Mr Speaker, I hope that the Prime Minister has time to reflect on his conduct in office with all his new spare time, and I genuinely hope that he finds some peace of mind. The fact is though, that, as well as a record-breaker, the Prime Minister is a rule-breaker, illegally shutting down Parliament, parting through the pandemic, handing out PPE contracts to cronies, yep. unilaterally changing the ministerial code. Yep. And let us not forget, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is still under investigation because he can't be trusted to tell the truth. Shameful, disgraceful and a complete waste of Scotland's time. This is how the people of Scotland will remember this Prime Minister. Isn't it the case that the Prime Minister and his government should have had its last day a long time ago. Quite simply, Downing Street is no place for a lawbreaker. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, look, Mr. Speaker, he's, I, I think on the, the points, he's, the personal abuse stuff. I, I think he's talking a load of tosh. But when he's when he's up, idiot, but when he's up when he's up in his, when he's retired to uh, the, 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 his croft, uh, which may be all too soon, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I hope that he will reflect on his long-running campaign to break up the greatest country in the world, and uh, I hope he will reflect on the on the pointlessness of what he uh, is trying to do, and, and think instead about the priorities of the people of Scotland, which I think are about all the issues uh, that he thought were trivial, about their education, about crime, Mr. Speaker, and about the about the burden uh, of taxation that they are unnecessarily placing on the people of Scotland. Michael Longy. A long time ago, when I trained as a pilot, I had the luxury of being able to fly around turbulent storms, and, but what I also had was the ability to, to rely on a team that kept my aircraft airworthy. As the Prime Minister prepares his new flight plans, could I suggest that he might reset his compass to true north and stops off in Dudley? where he will always be welcomed with open arms, with sincere affection, and where he will be able to see the legacy of what he is. I've got my honourable friend, and I, I thank him for that, that renewed invitation, Mr. Speaker. I've, I've spent many happy days uh, with him in Dudley, and uh, let's hope that there are more to come. And David, as the Prime Minister leaves office, I'm sure the whole House is looking forward to him completing his book on Shakespeare. <laughs> we wait to read what he really thinks about tragic figures brought down by their vaulting ambition, <laughs> or scheming politicians who conspire to bring down a tyrannical leader. The candidates, Mr Speaker, now plotting to take his place, all profess that they will bring a fresh start, a clean break from his government. But does the Prime Minister not agree with me that a fresh start and a clean break would require a new mandate from the British people? Yeah. And before they strut and fret their hour upon the stage, there should be a general election. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I think that Polonius, that's who he is. Yes. Uh, what you need, more matter with less art, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, the, 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 only thing, the only thing you need to know, if, if there were to be a general election, of course, the Liberal Democrats would rightly get thrashed, because that would be... That, that, is the, that is the moment, that is the moment, that is the moment when the public actually look with horror at what Liberal Democrat policies really are. And, 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 all, and, all, and all these rural voters would discover the massive green taxes uh, that they would like to apply. Uh, and the, the only risk is that there, there could be some kind of crackpot coalition uh, between those guys and the Lib Dems uh, and, and the Scottish Nationalists uh, to, put, to put that into effect. That is what we must prevent. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents feel very let down by the Mayor of London. Yeah. He is consulting on cutting 18% of London's buses. The Met is in special measures. He's looking to sell Notting Hill Police Station to the highest bidder, and he is looking to push through a completely unwanted overdevelopment of South Kensington yeah. Tube Station. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that Londoners deserve way, way better? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, London once had a mayor who cut crime uh, by 25 per cent and cut the murder rate uh, by 30 per cent and built twice as many affordable homes as the current incumbent. And what London needs is another Conservative mayor. Yeah. Jamie Stone. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Could I just add a personal note of thanks to Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, who is retiring. He is a Highland gentleman and he has been very, very helpful to me for a number of years and I am extremely grateful. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows that harnessing will power, wind power is crucial to the United Kingdom. The Prime Minister also knows that the Highlands have faced great historic difficulties over the years. So I hope that the Prime Minister agrees with me that a green free port in the Cromarty Firth is vital to harnessing wind energy, it has the full support of the industry and vital to the prosperity of that region. 
I thank you very much. I can confirm that we're committed to funding two uh, free port, new green free ports in Scotland to the tune of £52 million. It wouldn't be possible, of course, if the SNP got their way and we returned to the EU. Jay Burry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate my friend on his work to tackle regional inequality in this country through his levelling up agenda? And as he rightly reflects with pride this summer on the work of both himself and his government, will he also urge all candidates in this leadership election and all colleagues in this House to further drive forward that levelling up agenda to tackle inequality wherever it is found within this United Kingdom? Yeah. I, I hardly agree with my hon. Friend, Mr Speaker, and it's not just uh, my right honourable friend, it's not just uh, inequality, it's inequality of opportunity, and that's what levelling up addresses. Johnny Lloyd, sir. Th- thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, very few people in the north of England believe that the levelling up agenda has achieved anything at all. Now, the Prime Minister has a, a few days left in office. Can he use this to drive through the, the Trans Pennine rail system that we were promised would be finished in 2019 and will not be finished before 2030? It's a shambles and he is responsible. Yeah. Actually, Mr Speaker, this government is responsible uh, for three new high-speed lines, including a Northern Powerhouse Rail, which no previous government has done. Caroline Notes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend rightly paid tribute to our hard-working firefighters dealing with the fires over the last few days in this unprecedented weather. Will my right honourable friend take action to make sure more fires can be prevented by getting rid of disposable barbecues and Chinese sky lanterns? The ones that flow. Uh, right. I thank, I thank my, my honourable friend very much for her suggestions. I think the key thing is for people uh, to behave responsibly uh, first uh, with the use uh, of these things. It's clearly insane to take a, a disposable barbecue onto dry grass. Yeah. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Due to Scottish Government investment in affordable housing, the Scottish child payment, and extended free school meals. Scotland has the lowest level of child poverty in the UK, in contrast to the North East, which has risen by 50 per cent on the watch of this Government. In contrast, the Prime Minister took over £1,000 from the poorest families, so much for levelling up, and those fighting to replace him have been falling over themselves to promise tax cuts to the wealthy. So if the UK is meant to be a voluntary union, Does he not recognise that voters in Scotland have the right to a referendum so they can choose a fairer future? Actually, Mr Speaker, we increased the living wage across the whole of the UK uh, by £1,000. We made sure that people on universal credit uh, got their tax bills cut uh, by £1,000. And and in the last couple of weeks, we've cut uh, cut national insurance contributions by an average of £330. And it was because of the union that we were able to support families up and down uh, the country in Scotland uh, with the furlough and other payments to the tune of £408 billion, Mr Speaker. Andrew Bowie. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, can I, thank, can, I, can I thank my right honourable friend for his commitment to Scotland and the entire United Kingdom over his years in Downing Street, and to him and my friend the Secretary of State for Scotland for improving and increasing the visibility and involvement of the UK government in Scotland over the past three years? And does my right honourable friend agree with me? That whoever takes his job and whatever comes next, the United Kingdom will always be stronger together than it ever would be apart. Brilliantly put. I couldn't put it better myself. Okay, talk to me. The Windrush compensation scheme was launched in April 2019. In the time since, we've seen this Prime Minister come and go. Meanwhile, just one in four applicants have received compensation so far, and at least 28 have sadly passed away without receiving compensation. Isn't it about time for the government to make the scheme independent of the Home Office and finally provide justice to the victims before it is too late? Uh, actually, Mr Speaker, I think more people have got compensation. Uh, under, I, mean, I, I, I renew my apologies to the Windrush uh, generation for what they uh, have suffered. Uh, but we have greatly uh, increased the compensation available. Uh, we've paid out, I think, more than £51 million. Pounds. We're working with voluntary groups uh, to ensure that people get what they're entitled to. Uh, but I may say uh, that Labour has never apologised for their own part in the Windrush scandal. Yeah. 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 
Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, for all of the work he has done for Scunthorpe, but can I pay particular thanks to him for the work that he has done for Steel? Understanding both of the challenges that Steele faces and of its importance to this nation, he has kept every promise he has made to me on steel. Yeah. And I want to thank him very much for his work on that. Does he agree with me that the future of steel is always safest under a Conservative yeah. government? Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, and I thank her for everything that she has done to champion UK steel, a vital national industry. So, Hannah. Mr Speaker, this Prime Minister has been the very embodiment of the excess and the vice that the Ministerial Code was designed to protect, and once trust is broken, it's very hard to rebuild. The trust of the Good Friday Agreement between the peoples and between the governments of these islands has been systematically destroyed over the last six years, and people across the island of Ireland, whether unionist or nationalist, or neither have looked on in horror at the degradation of the rule of law, at the deterioration of Anglo-Irish relationships and at the bolstering of the far right. Many of us will work to try and restore those relationships and ensure the decent people of Britain and Ireland live entwined lives for many years to come. Can I ask the Prime Minister if he is capable of any self-reflection? Does he have any regrets of his legacy of damaging our fragile, shared society and all the people of Northern Ireland? Well, Mr. Speaker, I completely uh, disagree with that. Uh, the, the, the whole objective of the, uh, of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill that we've passed is to support the uh, Belfast Good Friday uh, arrangements, to support the balance uh, of those and symmetry of, of those arrangements. And I was very pleased that uh, it, it passed its, uh, uh, it got its advance into the House of Lords with no amendments, Mr. Speaker. Chris Bidblad. Mr. Speaker, in recalling the situation that the Prime Minister inherited in July. Uh, 2019, of a, a parliament with a majority determined to frustrate the result of the 2016 referendum, uh, led by uh, a speaker who was just slightly partial, um, and the seemingly impossible situation we found, uh, does my right honourable friend understand that he has uh, the gratitude of my constituents that can identify the wood from the trees and myself for his leadership over the last few years? Mr. Speaker, I'm, like, I'm, very, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, and uh, uh, you know, there's a fair amount of wood on the opposite bench, uh, and I think that's why we will prevail in the next general election. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2014, the Tory Party have had more prime ministers than we've had referendums. May I remind the PM of the Smith Commission report? It states it is agreed by all parties that nothing in this report prevents Scotland becoming an independent country. Therefore. Does the Prime Minister believe in a democracy and will he respect the people of Scotland's right to self-determination? Mr Speaker, I think that uh, the people of Scotland uh, uh, do not, frankly, want to be talking about constitutional issues when there are when, uh, another referendum, uh, when the issues before the country are fu- the cost of living, uh, the educational issues that we discussed, drugs, crime, Mr Speaker, I think they are far more pressing. Mark Francois. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister spoke earlier about the atrocities carried out by the IRA. For decades, many men and women had the courage to put on the Queen's uniform and uphold law and order in Northern Ireland on Operation Banner. One of the Prime Minister's uh, undoubted achievements is he brought in the Northern Ireland Legacy Bill so that those people who served their country can finally sleep safely in their beds. Thank you for that, Prime Minister, if I may be so presumptuous on their behalf. You kept your word to me. Well, I'd like to thank my old friend for everything he did to campaign on that issue for, uh, for so long. And I'm glad that this government was indeed able to fulfil its promise, uh, not just to the uh, veterans, uh, but to their families uh, as well. And I would like to uh, renew my thanks uh, to the security services who do so much to keep us safe, but also to all those who put on the Queen's uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Colin. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, the OECD forecasts the UK economy with zero growth in GDP for 2023. That would be the worst performance in the G7. Ireland, Switzerland, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Iceland, Sweden, Austria, Belgium and Finland are all wealthier than the UK. Why should Scotland not be afforded the same opportunity to seek prosperity through being a sovereign 
independent nation standing as an equal amongst other equal nations. Uh, Mr Speaker, the UK uh, was the fastest in the G7 last year. We'll return to the uh, top of the table uh, soon uh, because we came out of Covid fastest and 0.5% growth in May, Mr Speaker. And the people of Scotland, don't forget, the people of Scotland, like the people of the whole of the UK, are supported by the massive fiscal firepower of the UK Treasury. And, uh, and, and that is a great advantage. Sherwin Rickory. Mr Speaker, and can I place on record my thanks particularly to the firefighters of Cornwall who were also extremely busy and courageous yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can I thank this Prime Minister for his support and enthusiasm for Cornwall and for the people of Cornwall over the last few years, not least for the hosting of the G7 last year. And can I also thank him for the investment of the, self, um, of the Shared Prosperity Fund, an investment of £132 million, which for an average national average of £17 a head, Cornwall sees £233 a head. And does my right hon. Friend agree that his enthusiasm for levelling up every part of the United Kingdom needs to carry on in the future. Yes, uh, she's a fantastic champion. My friend is a fantastic champion for, for Cornwall, and we will continue with our programme to support the Greater South West, whether it's through the, uh, the A303 or broadband. Uh, Mr Speaker, Cornwall has a bright future uh, with her as a representative. Justin Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While the Prime Minister has been on the randan at Chequers, people in Scotland are suffering because of this Tory cost of living crisis and we're paying a high price for his disastrous hard Brexit imposed against the wishes of Scottish voters. It's time to end this democracy denial, Prime Minister. Scotland can't afford to stay shackled to this crumbling union and Tory government that we don't vote for. Does the Prime Minister not accept that Scotland is a democracy? He has no right to overrule the votes of people in Scotland, and we will have the referendum that we voted for. Mr Speaker, this is the, uh, the country that uh, secured uh, furlough, that delivered the vaccine across the whole of the, of the UK, while the SNP gets on with overtaxing uh, to the tune of £900 million. Pounds, Mr Speaker, that's what they're overtaxing in Scotland, and we had a referendum, Mr Speaker, in 2014. Yes. Martin Vickers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know that my right honourable friend is aware of how important the seafood processing industry is to the Grimsby Cleethorpes area. Uh, however, there is one cloud on the horizon, and that is the recently imposed 35% tariff on white fish, which is causing industry leaders uh, considerable concern. And though they recognise that the, it's important to maintain sanctions against Russia, this is causing, uh, as I say, great concern. Would uh, my right honourable friend uh, arrange meetings with me and, and my honourable friend from Grimsby with the appropriate ministers so we can discuss measures how to mitigate the impact on the industry? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, I'll make sure he gets a, a meeting as soon as possible with the relevant minister, but I think it is very important that we uh, encourage our great fish and chips shops in, uh, in Grimsby, Cleethorpes and, and, and elsewhere uh, to make sure they're not just using uh, Russian uh, fish and chips. John Littleson. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. As the uh, Prime Minister limps off into the history books, his name up there in the pantheon of greats alongside the Duke of Portland and Spencer Percival, can he uh, update us on his defenestration honours list? How many of his cronies Will he ennoble? Can we expect him? Can we expect him to surpass Harold Wilson with a lavender list of dodgy donors, obsequious courtiers, and pinchers by nature? Very uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that everybody who has uh, served this government loyally and, and well uh, deserves recognition of some kind. Uh, but as for the honours list, I'm afraid he'll have to contain uh, his excitement. Can, can I just say, we wanted good temper and better moderate language, and I don't think we got it then. <coughs> right, well, I know we didn't. Anna Fair. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his support for the new city of Southend. Yeah. Our brilliant hospital turns 90 next Tuesday, uh, but our heroic NHS staff are hampered by the size of the A&E department. Conservative-led capital funding of £8.4 million to expand the A&E department was promised five years ago, but has not quite arrived. Will my right honourable friend encourage the new, the new Health Secretary to give us the best 
birthday present ever. And in the words of Cuba Gooding Jr., show me the money. Order. I think the Prime Minister has got the message also. I'd like, I'd like to hear your question she's, she's as well. She's a brilliant champion for Essex and uh, for her hospital. Uh, I, I know the case is under uh, review by the uh, department, but never forget it's only possible because of the money uh, that this government is investing. Yeah. Go round, Davis. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister will be remembered as a man of his word. Yeah. Pile him high, 200,000 dead, mm. the highest in Europe. Yeah. F, F business. For this is the truth. They don't like it, do they? Yeah. Let's listen to the truth. 400,000 fewer people in jobs than before the pandemic, yeah. if you include the self-employed, which the Prime Minister doesn't. So will he now keep faith to the 3.7 million people who have taken out student loans since this Conservative government was in power, who now face rising inflation in terms of rent, in terms of heating, in terms of eating, who now must pay seven... Listen to that rabble. Listen to them. Sit down a minute. Just sit. <laughs> when I stand, it's easy if you sit down. It helps all of the children. I want to get to the end of the question. I know he's going right to the end now. Go around, Davis. The 3.7 million people who face 7% interest rates from September, as well as the inflation on heating and eating and rent, when mortgages are 2%. Will he help those people in need, or will he help the city people who are making his friends making all this money out of the cost of living crisis? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'll tell you what students want. They want to be able to have a system where they don't pay back more than they borrow, and that's what we're putting in. Yeah. But they want to make sure also, Mr Speaker, that they have a jobs market uh, that will take them on with high-wage, high-skilled jobs. And the difference between them and us is that we get people into high-wage, high-skilled jobs. They're prepared to let them languish on the dole, Mr Speaker. And that, and that is the difference. Final question, Sir Edward Lee. Yeah. On behalf of the House, may I thank the Prime Minister. <laughs> On behalf of the House, may I thank the Prime Minister for his three years' record of service. On behalf of some of the most vulnerable people in the country, can I thank him for his insistence on rolling out the AstraZeneca jab, which has saved thousands of lives. On behalf of 17.4 million people who voted Brexit, may I thank him for restoring people's belief in democracy. On behalf of Northern Towns, may I thank him for his commitment to levelling up. And most of all, on behalf of the people of Ukraine, may I thank him for holding high the torch of freedom and ensuring that that country is not a vassal state. Yeah. For true grit and determination, keep going and thank you. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my, want to thank my right honourable friend, and I want to give, I want to, I want to use the last few seconds, Mr. Speaker, to give some words of advice to, uh, to my successor, whoever he or she uh, may be. Number one, stay close to the Americans, stick up for the Ukrainians, stick up for freedom and democracy everywhere. Cut taxes and deregulate wherever you can to make this the greatest place to live and invest, which it is. I love the Treasury, but remember that if we'd always listened to the Treasury, we wouldn't have built the M25 or the Channel Tunnel. Focus, focus on the road ahead. Focus on the road ahead, but always remember to check the rear view mirror. And remember, remember, above all, it's not Twitter that counts. It's the people that sent us here. And yes, sir, the, the, the last few years have been the greatest privilege of, of my life. And it's true that I, I helped to get the biggest Tory majority for 40 years and a, a huge realignment in UK politics, Mr Speaker. We've transformed our democracy and restored our national independence, as my right honourable friend says. We've helped, I've helped to get this country through a pandemic and help save another country from barbarism. And frankly, that's enough to be going on with. 
mission largely accomplished. For now, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all the wonderful staff of the House of Commons. I want to thank all my friends and colleagues. I want to thank my right friend uh, opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank everybody here and hasta la vista, baby. Thank you. We now come to the statements. I'm looking for Mr. Malthouse. He's here. How could I lose him? going to come to the statement on the heatwave response. I call the Secretary of State, Kit Malthouse. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on this week's heatwave. Coningsby in Lincolnshire broke records yesterday when it registered a provisional reading of 40.3 degrees Celsius. According to the Met Office, no fewer than 34 locations around the United Kingdom exceeded the country's previous highest temperature of 37.8 Celsius set in 2019. We have seen a collective national endeavour to prepare for and manage the effects of the heat, from Town Hall to Whitehall and across various industries to keep people safe and infrastructure functioning. From water companies and rail engineers to public servants right across the land, everyone has pulled together, with members of the public responding in a way that was responsible and took the pressure off vital public services. Our national resolve has been exemplified by our fire and rescue services for many of whom yesterday was the busiest day since World War II. They were undoubtedly stretched but coped magnificently, and the systems put in place to make sure the fire service can operate on a national basis as well as locally worked well. In tinderbox conditions, they have dealt with dozens of wildfires around the country over the past 24 hours. Fifteen fire and rescue services declared major incidents and handled emergency calls the length and breadth of the country. Sadly, Mr Speaker, at least 41 properties have been destroyed in London, 14 in Norfolk, 5 in Lincolnshire and smaller numbers elsewhere. On behalf of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, and I am sure the whole House, I would like to pass on our sincere condolences to those who have lost their homes or business premises. And I know my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, is working closely with local authorities to provide support to them. Throughout recent days, the Prime Minister has monitored our work and has been specifically briefed on a number of occasions. We did so again this morning. The Prime Minister was briefed during the wildfires by Mark Hardingham, Chair of the National Fire Chiefs Council and the Civil Contingency Secretariat, and he has also passed on his thanks to all the brave firefighters who have sought to control the flames in such debilitating conditions. I would also, Mr Speaker, like to pay my tribute to the fire control staff, officers and support teams for their essential work, and the other agencies that have made such tremendous efforts in recent days, the NHS, our emergency call handlers, police and maritime and coast guard agency, amongst many others. Honourable members will be relieved to know that some pressure on these services will now ease uh, as the fiercest heat has subsided. Many incidents are now being scaled back. Thunderstorms are likely this afternoon, but for much of the country, more clement, dry conditions are the pattern in coming days. The Met Office, however, stresses that the summer is likely to bring further hot weather and wildfire risk remains elevated. That is why we are treating this heat wave as an exacting test of our national resilience and contingency planning. As always, Mr Speaker, there is no room for complacency. We have seen over the last few days what you can achieve when you prepare properly and then work closely together. Owing to the technical expertise of the weather forecasters who predicted with admirable precision the peak of the heat wave and how high the temperatures would be, the Government was able to launch an advanced campaign of comprehensive public advice. And our early data shows how well before the heat wave arrived, 
people were taking on board this advice from the UK Health Security Agency, the NHS, the Chief and Deputy Medical Chief Officer, emergency services and key agencies on the ground. And because of our established local networks and colleagues in the devolved administrations, we had people spread across the UK ready to step in when it matters. I am particularly grateful, Mr Speaker, to the, for the cooperation and support we received from the Scottish Government, Welsh Government and Northern Ireland Executive. We all need to manage these events together. Now, Mr Speaker, I'd like to give some examples of how people taking the right action helped to mitigate the effects of the extreme weather, starting with heeding advice. Fully five times as many people accessed NHS England internet pages on how to manage the symptoms of heat exhaustion in the critical week beginning July the 11th. That's five times as many. Moving on to our vital 999 call services, we had feared that they would come under untold pressure, yet as the mercury climbed inexorably on July the 18th, fewer 999 calls were made than the week before, and more 111 calls, again suggesting that the public had heeded the advice this time to avoid triple nine unless in emergencies. And on to travel, Mr Speaker, and once again people were playing for the team. The public stayed at home to avoid the heat, not venturing far. The data bears this out. On Monday, footfall at major London stations was around 35% of normal post-pandemic levels. Yesterday, Network Rail reports passenger train numbers were around 40% down on the previous week. We did not forget those who cannot easily leave their homes either, asking people to look out for the elderly and vulnerable family members and neighbours. Tragically, however, Mr Speaker, 13 people are believed to have lost their lives after getting into difficulty in rivers, reservoirs and lakes while swimming in recent days, seven of them sadly teenage boys. And I would li like to pass on our sincere condolences and that of the whole House to the families of the victims for their terrible loss. Of course, we still have work uh, to work through the longer-term consequences of the heat wave. The true picture will not come until all incidents are analysed, all emergency teams are debriefed and all incident logs and data reconciled. There is a great deal of data yet to come in from colleagues in the devolved administrations and from the local authorities and agencies around the country. We do recognise, Mr Speaker, that we are likely to experience more of these incidents and that we should not underestimate their speed, scope and severity. Britain may be unaccustomed to such high temperatures, but the UK, along with our European neighbours, must learn to live with extreme events such as these. The Government has been at the forefront of the international efforts to reach net zero, but the impacts of climate change are with us now. This is why we have a national adaptation programme under the leadership of the Environment Department. As we have seen in recent days, we will continue to face acute events driven by climate change. It is the responsibility of the Cabinet Office Ministers to coordinate work across Government when these events take place. The Government will continue to build our collective resilience. To this end, the National Resilience Strategy, about which I was asked on Monday, will be launched at the earliest possible opportunity by the incoming Administration. In the meantime, I will continue to coordinate the work of teams across Government in building resilience to make sure the country is ready to meet the challenges of the autumn, the winter and beyond. And it is in that spirit that I commend this statement to the House. Uh, we now come to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Angela Rayner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The events of the last few days have been incredibly traumatic for communities across Britain. Individuals and families have had their homes destroyed, and as the Minister says, lives have been lost. And as a mother of teenagers, Mr Speaker, I reiterate, they must not swim in our rivers. It is too dangerous for them to do that. Farmers and businesses have also seen their livelihoods go up in smoke. We saw horrifying images of the A2 on fire yesterday. And I want to join the Minister in paying tribute to the incredible bravery of our fire services and those whose job it is to head straight into danger as the rest of us escape it. Mm -hmm. Sadly, four firefighters have been hospitalised in South Yorkshire and over a dozen injured in London. I know the whole House will give them our gratitude and wish them well. But for too long, Mr Speaker, our public servants have been underappreciated and undervalued by this government. The Minister mentioned our fire services. Over the last 10 years, their funding and staffing of the fire and rescue service has been cut and response times have gone up by 8%. Yesterday, no mutual aid was available to services facing literal firestorms. Mr Speaker, this statement today is far too late. Yeah. The impact of this heatwave was 
completely predictable. Why the delay in coming to this House? It has literally taken the country to go up in flames for the Minister to turn his focus on this emergency. Yeah. Climate change, Mr Speaker, will cause more and more national emergencies like this, from heat waves to fires, floods and pandemics. But as we've seen over the past week, the leadership contenders are doing their hardest to outbid each other on how they would yeah. cut action on climate change. Yeah. They will leave us vulnerable to more freak natural disasters. Mm -hmm. The caretaker minister opposite says it's his job to chair COBRA meetings, but it should be the job of the Prime Minister to lead. Yesterday, the remaining cabinet gave the Prime Minister the complete volumes of Sir Winston Churchill as a leaving gift. But he is no Churchill, Mr Speaker. He has been missing in action. And can the Minister tell us where he was as the country burned? Where was he when Cobra was called last weekend? Has the Prime Minister attended, attended any talks with ministers or senior officials in the days since? Isn't it the truth? that the Prime Minister and his entire government have gone missing while Britain burns. Yeah. We might have cooler temperatures today, Mr Speaker, but another heat wave is inevitable as our climate heats up. Britain cannot continue to be so unprepared. He tells people to drink water and wear a hat. It's just not good enough. We need a long-term emergency resilience plan for the future. So can the Minister say, where is the plan? for delivery of essential services. How will people be kept safe at work, on transport, in hospitals and in our care homes? Where is the guidance for safe indoor working temperatures? He now says the government's national resilience plan will be published in due course by the new administration. It's already 10 months overdue, Mr exactly. Speaker. Why should the British people be forced to wait a whole year? Yeah. It is the primary duty of any government to keep the public safe, and Britain deserves much better than this. Labour has already has a resilience plan for the long term. We would implement a department-wide approach and appoint a minister for resilience. We would give local government the resources they need to plan and prepare for emergencies. And I'd just like to say that local government has been on the front line, and I pay tribute to their response to this crisis and what they did during the pandemic. But their resilience, Mr Speaker, has been eroded by 12 years of cuts and austerity at the hands of this government. Yep. And finally, Mr Speaker, we would, Labour would empower businesses and civil society organisations to strengthen our response. Homes have been destroyed, our brave firefighters hospitalised and lives have been ruined and lost. Enough is enough. If he's not willing to take the action, Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House are. Yeah. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, what a shame. Uh, that notwithstanding uh, the loss of some homes and obviously some tragic deaths in water-related incidents, the Honourable Lady didn't take the opportunity to recognise that, by and large, the system worked, uh, that the planning we put in place and the resilience that we built into all those public services and public servants, frankly, that she lauded, uh, actually meant that the country got through this particular extreme weather event um, in, in pretty good shape. Uh, we obviously recognise that there were some unfortunate incidents and, as I say, a number of homes that were... Um, uh, set on fire. Uh, but the fact that we uh, kept the damage to a minimum, that the vast majority of the population got through this uh, difficulty well, uh, was not recognised by her at all. And I think that's a real shame. Secondly, just to correct something that she claimed when she said there was no mutual aid available. This is not correct. There was one um, uh, fire and rescue service that called for national mutual aid, which was Norfolk, and mutual aid was provided uh, from other parts of the, the country. Um, so that the uh, system we have in place for flexing the use of the fire service across the whole of the country worked extremely well, as the uh, chair of the National Fire Chiefs Council was able to confirm to the Prime Minister uh, last night and indeed this morning. Uh, now, the Honourable Lady seemed to claim that this was the first time I've turned up to the House. Uh, it's not. It's the second time I've been in the House to discuss this issue, and we've been working on this since the uh, weather forecasters. Um, uh, gave us notification that this extreme weather event was likely to occur. It is, however, Mr Speaker, the first time the Honourable Lady has turned up to the House yeah. while well, you were doing a radio station. Well, being in your office is not being on the front bench. Present but not involved, I think, is the claim from the Labour Party. So before she starts flinging stones, maybe she should polish the glass in her house uh, before she claims that others are, are not doing their 
job. And as to the involvement of the Prime Minister, uh, he's been kept in touch with our work throughout, either through personal briefings by me or, indeed, uh, last night this morning, briefings by the uh, Chief Officer of the National Fire Chiefs Council and the Civil Contingency Secretariat. Uh, she, I am afraid, will never know because I hope she's never in government. Uh, <laughs> number 10 and the Cabinet Office work very closely together when these emergency situations arise and where we need to put in place plans and specific coordination work to make sure that we all understand what the picture is. As far as the resilience plan, as I said, the plan is, is, is in, in progress and will be launched as soon as we get a new administration into number 10. But she should not mistake the publication of a national resilience plan uh, for us not having any plans at all. And as we saw, Mr. Speaker, in all manner of areas of the function in our country, the plans that we have in place worked well. The capacity that we stood up flexed brilliantly often uh, to deal with this ever-changing uh, situation. And as I say, most of the country uh, got through it in, in good shape. And as for the appointment to, of a Minister of Resilience, well, I'm afraid we already have one. It's me. Um, the job of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, the job of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster is to look after the Civil Contingency Secretariat, which is to deal specifically with issues of resilience and make sure the system works as it did largely yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. James Wilde. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, wildfires in Northwest Norfolk destroyed properties in Brancaster State and also destroyed habitats and wildlife at the famous Wild Ken Hill Estate, that's well known from hosting the BBC Springwatch. So. Can I put on record my constituents' immense thanks to the Norfolk Fire Service and the other emergency services, as well as all those in the local community who helped to tackle these blazes in such awful circumstances, and they will recover and rebuild those communities. And in doing so, will he also reinforce our commitment to achieve net zero so that we are better protected from this climate change? Well, the Honourable uh, Gentleman is quite right that Norfolk Fire and Refuge Service was severely tested uh, yesterday and indeed did receive mutual aid, I think, from as far afield as, as Merseyside to, to help them in that battle. And they will uh, stay, I understand, in situ uh, to make sure that the uh, Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service can kind of get back on its feet and deal with anything that may come in the next uh, few days. And while we are very focused on the continuing elevated risk of wildfires, he is quite right that the long-term work for us both to, to make our own contribution to the battle against climate change, but frankly to lead the world and challenge some of the biggest polluters in the world to change their uh, habits and their uses of fuel is absolutely critical. And I know that uh, in parliaments to come, he will be in the forefront of that fight. Ren O'Hara, the SNP spokesperson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for prior sight of his statement. And let me begin by paying tribute to all of the emergency services who have once again gone above and beyond to help their fellow citizens in this time of crisis. And may I extend our sympathy also to those people whose homes and businesses have been destroyed by the fires that raged across parts of England. Mr Speaker, we may not have known anything like this before, with record temperatures being set in three of the four nations of the UK and with a symbolic 40 degree barrier being broken in England, but sadly, I predict that something like this is here to stay, and we're all going to have to live with it, and governments are going to have to prepare for it in the future. Mr Speaker, climate scientists have been warning us for decades that this day was coming, and it would be disingenuous in the extreme for anyone to claim that this was a one-off freak event, or even dare compare it to the summer of 1976. This is the climate emergency. This is exactly what we were told would happen if we didn't change our ways. Exactly. This is what COP26 was all about. And that's why those who are still part of this Tory leadership race cannot, must not, renege on their commitment to achieving net zero and return for securing votes from the party's base. So could the minister tell me, where is the plan to increase and bolster resilience so that the government response in the future, the guaranteed future heat waves, is more coordinated and strategic than we have witnessed. And with melting roads, buckling rail tracks and dissolving runways, what plans are being considered to make our critical infrastructure more resilient to this type of heat? And finally, does he agree with me, and I suspect the majority of the country, that the optics of the Prime Minister deciding to party while parts of the UK literally burned, showed a complete unawareness of lack of self-awareness and a complete dereliction of duty. Here, here. 
Well, Mr Speaker, uh, can I join, first of all, the Honourable Gentleman in celebrating our firefighters? It is a really remarkable form of public service to run towards an inferno um, in all circumstances, and particularly uh, wildfires, which I know can be very challenging for firefighters to address, not least because they often cover a much wider area, say, than a, a house fire. And it was particularly difficult, as I understand it, yesterday, because, of course, the ambient temperature was very high. Firefighters have to wear very heavy clothing and equipment, so it's particularly debilitating physically upon them. So he is right to uh, celebrate them. I'm sure he is aware uh, that as far as building resilience into our infrastructure, we do have a national adaptation plan. Um, uh, and as we go through periods like this um, particular heat wave, uh, we need to learn the lessons and adjust that plan accordingly. So, for example, there's been much debate over the last 24 hours about the impact on the rail system and what tolerances we build our railways to. Now, that obviously has a, a wide impact on the system. We need to learn from our European partners, because while you might stress your railway to deal with high temperatures, that stressing may not accommodate, for example, in Scotland, some of the very low temperatures uh, which are achieved. And having uniformity across the, the country is completely critical. And as to attending the COBRA, I would just gently point out to the Honourable Gentleman that the First Minister of Scotland didn't attend either. Um, and we had very happily uh, uh, the Deputy First Minister or indeed other Cabinet members uh, that joined, and they were able to function perfectly well in COBRA, as I'm sure she would have done. Jackie Doyle Price. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I associate myself with the comments made by all honourable members who paid tribute to the emergency services who, who uh, tackled these challenges fearlessly, in particular uh, the fire at Wennington, which generated a smoke cloud which spread across the whole of East London and Thurrock, which shows just how challenging it was. But I'd particularly like to uh, draw my honourable friend's uh, attention to the River Thames. He mentioned drowning incidents. And it has been charging for the Port of London Authority for many years to actually encourage local authorities to do their bit uh, to tackle drowning prevention, one, by raising awareness of just how dangerous the River Thames is as a waterway, and two, by making sure that there is su sufficient safety equipment. Would you take this opportunity to perhaps remind them to work collaboratively with the PLA to actually address this? Well, Mr Speaker, I do think one of the lessons that comes out of this for all of us, uh, not least, of course, in, in Scotland, where the schools are not sitting at the moment, where term has finished, um, is to underline to people who live or want to use bodies of water the dangers are, that are inherent in them. It, she, the Honourable Lady is quite right uh, that the Thames may look like an innocent uh, retreat from the heat, uh, but beneath the waves there are strong currents. Uh, which can, and we often see people get into difficulty therein. She raises a good point about the Port of London Authority, and I will take that away, if I may, and see what more we can do to coordinate between them and the, and the riparian authorities. Ian Labour. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the men and women of the Fire and Rescue Service were quite simply awe-inspiring yesterday, like they regularly are. But you know, they cannot continue to work miracles, uh, Minister. The impact of 12 years of cutting and and austerity on the fire and rescue service has been an absolute disaster. And it quite simply needs much more critical investment if we're to tackle climate change correctly. The morale within the, the fire and rescue uh, service is at an all-time low. And this week, the government offered the, the members of the fire and rescue service a paltry 2% pay increase. Absolutely outrageous! to offer men and women who the Minister of Sears was running towards the inferno yesterday. Two per cent. Minister, it's time we stop clapping the great members of Fire and Rescue Service and start paying them. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman I sure knows, uh, pay is not of the of firefighters, is not within the control of their government and is set by the, uh, a body that involves both employees and the employers, many of whom are Labour-controlled local authorities. Uh, so while uh, he may have strong views about the percentage that has been offered to the firefighters, this is a challenge that he has to put down to some of his own colleagues, not to the, uh, uh, to the government. Um, as he knows, uh, the fire service has been remarkably successful. Um, over the last uh, decade or so, or longer, in driving down the absolute number of fires with which they have to deal. Much of that is about their prevention work, which has been uh, brilliant, but also about technology changes, not least in, in furniture uh, composition. Um, I'm sure he is also aware that there is a white paper out at the moment on fire reform, and I hope that he will make a useful contribution to it. Dr Neil Hudson. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank my right honourable friend for his statement and thank him and, and his department, the cross government working in the planning and resilience in these unprecedented weather times. Can I thank our emergency services, people in the public services, the NHS in the front line, in fire and rescue, police, and our local authorities, our transport networks, and people at large, our community volunteers. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute to those people in Cumbria and right across the UK for all that they have done and continue to do to keep people safe? Well, Mr Speaker, that is a very welcome uh, question from the Honourable Gentleman, and I am, of course, more than happy to join him in thanking all those people who, as I say, played on the team uh, to get us through in such good shape. There were obviously some tragedies, uh, but the fact that we were able to minimise the number was a tribute to the work of all the organisations uh, that he mentioned. And while I am answering, can I also take the opportunity, Mr Speaker, to pay tribute uh, to my staff in the Civil Contingency Secretariat, who have worked round the clock um, over the last few days, and in particular closely with the Met Office as we sought to predict and prepare the country, coordinating across Whitehall and indeed all those other agencies. It has been a really remarkable effort and, um, uh, as I say, notwithstanding the, the terrible tragedies that we have seen, the fact that we got through in good shape uh, was down to all of their work. Dame Nana Johnson. This is the first opportunity I have had to congratulate the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, on his new role, and we shall miss scrutinising him on the Home Affairs Select Committee. Can I also um, add my thanks to the emergency services for everything they did yesterday to save property and lives? And as the, um, the Minister has already said, there is a white paper out about uh, the Fire and Rescue Service, which has a deadline on its consultation on the 26th of July, which I think is Sunday. And I just wonder, in light of the fact that the Home Affairs Select Committee will be looking at this in the autumn, whether it would also be sensible to extend that deadline, because what we do know is that the events of this week show that there's clear evidence of climate change-driven volatility, which will have serious implications for fire and rescue services. And it may be a good time to reflect on that before um, submitting to the consultation. So if it could be extended, that would be helpful. <coughs> Well, Mr Speaker, I am grateful to the Honourable Lady, and I certainly enjoyed being constructively challenged by her in my three years in the uh, policing job. Uh, I hope I made a small difference uh, to the safety of the public uh, during those years, but obviously that will be for others to judge. Um, obviously, the, the timing of the, of the White Paper is not within my remit, but I undertake the Honourable Lady to raise it with the Minister concerned and, and make the point that she's made. Where are we up now? Sammy Wilson. Sammy Wilson. Ms. First of all, can I also um, congratulate the emergency services on the excellent work which they did? But is it not a fact, Minister, that whilst we have been pursuing the policy of decarbonisation, spending huge amounts of money on that, £50 billion to the energy industry in the last 20 years, another £50 billion estimated by the OBR in the next three years, with little effect on our own climate or the world's climate. We can wave our puny fists at the forces of nature, but the fact of the matter is it's not working. Would we not be far better, instead of spending money on expensive attempts to decarbonise, to spend that money on adapting to the inevitable changes in our climate to make people safe when we have either extreme flooding or extreme heat? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman would agree that we should do both, um, that we should both adapt and we have a national adaptation strategy, but I would urge him uh, to be more optimistic about the impact that human ingenuity can have on solving the world's problems. We have seen throughout our history that the invention of technology in this country, um, uh, once established and proven to work, often accelerates progress uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, whether that is the invention of the spinning jenny or the loom, or, for example, uh, the invention of the, of the silicon chip and, indeed, the smartphone. It is, uh, Mr Speaker, less than 15 years ago uh, that the iPhone was invented. and in, in that just over a decade, pretty much the whole world has one. These things often start slow, but once they accelerate, they make a huge impact. Berisha. Bobby Seale, uh, that first retired his uh, campaigning book, Seize the Time. And can I ask the Minister to seize this time and this opportunity? 
Many of us have been campaigning on climate change and global warming for a long time. The really pivotal moment was when I read Professor Steve Jones, Here Comes the Sun, I think four years ago, and reviewed it. But the, the, the truth is, campaigners, and we're all campaigners at this place, you suddenly know some particular incident is going to change the public mood and the public mind in terms of the you know, urgency, priority, and the dramatic need for action. Will he please say to his ministers, the future ministers and future prime minister, that this is the time to capture the imagination and really get the public behind it? Well, Mr Speaker, the Honourable General is correct that incidents like these often seek to underline the importance of, the, of our, mission on, our collective mission on climate change. And I, as somebody who's uh, campaigned, I guess, and been an enthusiast for the hydrogen economy for over 20 years now, am always keen to welcome more people to the cause. But in truth, as we've seen in, in debates elsewhere over the last couple of weeks, um, we have to take care that as we seek to progress and fight climate change, we bring the population with us. And then we illustrate to them that the work we are doing um, not only will make their lives better, but critically that of their children, rather than being uh, characterised sometimes as purely a cost today. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm interested in what the Minister says about the, taking the public with us. Um, surely, in this past few days, the public have been well aware. Um, of the impact of climate change and see the heat wave not just here in the United Kingdom but the five heat waves that are taking place across Europe as a consequence of inaction of being too slow to react to climate change and while I hear what the Minister says I'm concerned about the contradiction between what we're hearing here today and what we hear about climate change and action to uh, combat it from his party's leadership election. So can the minister assure us that there is a commitment in government to continue to fight towards net zero as quickly as possible? Mr Speaker, the battle against climate change has been a central part of Conservative uh, policy uh, since the heady days of David Cameron, who campaigned on a slogan of Vote Blue, Go Green. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Mr Speaker. An illegal net zero strategy no national resilience strategy, 15 areas declaring major incidents, 11,500 firefighters cut since 2010, and a 2% pay offer on the table. Don't the front line of the climate emergency deserve better? Well, Mr Speaker, as I said earlier, that's a question which the Honourable Lady needs to uh, pose to her colleagues in, in local government, many of whom uh, are of the same party as her, as she knows perfectly well. Uh, the pay awards to firefighters, uh, as the Minister here knows perfectly well, the pay awards to firefighters are not within the control of the Government and are settled by a body that includes both employers and employees. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I pay tribute to South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service, who were doing amazing work yesterday under very difficult conditions to keep communities in my part of the world safe? The Minister, I'm sure, will be aware that the Joint Committee on the National Security Strategy is conducting a timely inquiry into critical national infrastructure and climate adaptation. Can I ask the Minister what plans he has to follow suit? Well, Mr Speaker, as we um, deal with these incidents, uh, both in the last uh, few days but over a summer where obviously the, the forecasters are telling us the risk it remains elevated, we will learn exactly the lessons uh, that he is asking us to learn and obviously we will review uh, the report that he produces. He will know, I am sure, that we pay constant attention to the resilience of our critical na national infrastructure, but as the climate changes, so should we. Rachel Musk. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I too commend the work of our NHS staff and North Yorkshire Fire Service, which currently is facing cuts, and I really mm. urge that those cuts do not go ahead. But, Mr Speaker, having dealt with a lot of flooding, I know what a resilience plan looks like. Yep. And yesterday, there just was not a resilience plan. There were no checks on the most vulnerable people in our community. There were no restrooms for a cool space for people that do not have such facilities. So can the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary go back and instruct all resilience areas to put in place a, a proper integrated resilience plan? Well, Mr Speaker, I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State of the Department for Housing, Levelling Up and Communities, was in close touch with the resilience forums and indeed I think attended their chairs meeting uh, earlier this Week. These are, are very good challenges and questions for her local resilience uh, forum, 
and I'd uh, be quite happy for her to arrange for her to meet the lead body on that resilience forum in her area, in York, uh, so that she can reassure herself that they have the right plans in place. Margaret Furry. I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement. Yesterday was the busiest day for London firefighters since the Second World War, and I would like to express my thanks to them for keeping us all safe, firefighters across the UK. I would also like to express my deepest condolences to the families of those that have died in recent days after getting into difficulties in the water. What support are ministers giving to organisations like the RNLI on campaigns such as Respect the Water to raise awareness of the dangers of open water swimming on hot days? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I obviously echo the Honourable Lady's thanks to the Fire Service, and I know all of us, specifically uh, the, the Fire Minister on the front bench here, have been watching in awe as firefighters uh, did their job over the last uh, 48 hours. There has been a strong communication campaign in coordination with the devolved administrations, not least in Scotland, of course, where the schools um, are not open at the moment, to illustrate uh, the dangers of, of young people specifically, but generally all of us, uh, diving or jumping into water about which we know very little. Um, uh, one of the lessons that has come out of the last couple of days, Mr Speaker, is possibly our need to target that communications more, um, uh, and we will make sure that uh, as we review what has happened over the last three or four days. This is one of the key things that we examine. James Shannon. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. It's always a pleasure to hear the, the Minister and uh, thank him for his statement. And also thank all of the Fire and Rescue Service for their endeavours, for their vital and important work they do across all of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Can the Minister outline if any discussions have taken place with the Ministry of Defence, for instance, to use our armed forces personnel to police lakes rivers, etc., as we see the heat wave pushing people to unsafe areas to swim. As the Minister referred to, 13 people are believed to have lost their lives over the last period of time. And I also uh, add my condolences to all of those families who grieve empty chair in their house, so I think of all those as well. Uh, does the Minister believe government can increase public safety to prevent further tragic loss of life, such as we have seen over the last few days? Thank you. Well, Mr Speaker, we obviously, uh, in the contemplation of any civil contingency situation, examine whether we have the capacity that we need to deal with it and, therefore, whether we can seek it elsewhere. And I'm sure the right honourable gentleman will remember, uh, frankly, the worst picture that we saw in, in wildfires in the north of England uh, in 2018, when Saddleworth Moor, White Hill, uh, very large extensive fires when uh, the armed forces were deployed uh, to assist the emergency services. It was not deemed appropriate uh, uh, in this occasion, and in fact our judgment proved to be correct uh, that the emergency services would cope. As far as uh, his challenge on, on whether we could do more uh, to educate people or indeed to target hard and, if you like, bodies of water which proved to be dangerous, I, as I said to the hon. Lady, that is definitely something which I think we will need to take away. And consider. I mean, obviously, we would urge parents in particular uh, to take responsibility and understand uh, where their children are going to be and warn them about some of the dangers, as we did with some of the, the, health, um, the health messaging about looking after elderly uh, neighbours. We all have to work together to keep our young people in particular safe. But we will examine what more we can do as we learn the lessons from this incident. Right, that ends that statement. We are now going to come to the next statement. I'll just let people leave the chamber. Right, we come to the next statement, the Secretary of State for Health, Women's Health Strategy for England. Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I'd like to make a statement about the Women's Health Strategy for England. I know that many honourable and right honourable members will agree that for too long, women's health has been hampered by fragmented services and women being ignored when they raise concerns about their pain. On too many occasions, we have heard of failures in patient safety because women raising concerns felt they had not been heard. For example, the Ockenden Review into the, the tragic failings of maternity care and the independent inquiry into the convicted surgeon Ian Patterson. Indeed, in my role as a constituency MP, I also remember the outstanding work of my constituent Kath Sampson and her Sling the Mesh campaign, where once again the response was too slow when women raised issues about their care. We are embarking on an important mission to improve how the health and care system listens to women's voices. 
and to boost health outcomes for women and girls from adolescence all the way through to later life. This isn't just important for women and girls, it's important for everyone, and this work is already well underway. Last month, we announced the appointment of Professor Dame Leslie Regan, one of the country's foremost experts on women's health, as the first ever women's health ambassador for England. On top of this, we're investing an extra 127 million in the NHS maternity workforce and neonatal care over the next year. And we are creating a network of family hubs in local authorities in England. Today, Mr. Speaker, we're announcing the next step. We're publishing the first ever Women's Health Strategy for England, setting out a wide range of commitments to improve the health of women and girls everywhere. I wanted to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the almost 100,000 women who took the time to share their stories with us, as painful as it may have been. Your voices have been heard, and were vital in shaping this strategy. And I'd like to set out the key components to the House this afternoon. First, we are putting in place a range of measures to ensure women are better listened to in the NHS. Indeed, 84% of respondents to our call for evidence recounted instances where they were not listened to by healthcare professionals. And we need to do more to tackle the disappointment and disillusionment that many women feel. We're working with NHS England to embed shared decision-making, where patients are given greater involvement in decisions relating to their care, including when it comes to women's health. Second, Mr Speaker, we want to see better access to services for all women and girls. Women and girls have told us that the fragmented commissioning and delivery of health services can impact their ability to access them. This means that they have to make multiple appointments to get the care they need, adding to the NHS backlog. There are better ways to deliver women's health through centres of excellence in the forms of women's health hubs, designed specifically to holistically assess women's health issues, and where specialist practitioners can be more attuned to concerns being raised. We are encouraging the expansion of these hubs, and indeed this morning I visited Homerton University Hospital to see the benefits these local one-stop clinics bring, enabling women to have all of their health needs met in one place. Third, Mr Speaker, it is essential that we address the lack of research into women's health conditions and improve the representation of women's data in all types of research. Currently, not enough is known about conditions that only affect women, as well as how conditions that affect both men and women impact them in different ways. The strategy sets out how we will tackle the women's health data gap to make sure health data is broken down by sex by default. Fourth, Madam Deputy Speaker, we will provide better information on edu and education on issues relating to women's health. Our call for evidence showed that fewer than one in ten respondents feel they have enough information on conditions uh, in areas such as the menopause, and that many people wanted trusted and accessible information about women's health. The NHS website is currently a trusted source of health information for many people, and we will transform the women's health contact to improve its existing pages and indeed our new pages on conditions that are not currently there. But we also know that the NHS will not be everyone's first port of call for health information, and so we will expand our health partnerships, like the partnership between YouTube and NHS Digital, who are working together to make sure that credible, clinically safe information appears prominently for UK audiences. It's also important that medical professionals have the best understanding of women's health. And I'm pleased that the General Medical Council will be introducing specific assessments on women's health for medical students, including on the menopause and on gynaecology. Fifth, our strategy sets out how we will support women at work. In the call for evidence, only one in three respondents felt comfortable talking about health issues 
in their workplace. And we also know that one in four women have considered leaving their job as a result of the menopause. So we will be focusing our health and wellbeing fund over the next three years on projects to support women's wellbeing in the workplace. And we will be encouraging businesses across the country to take up best practice, like the menopause workforce pledge that was recently signed by the NHS and the civil service. Sixth, we will place an intense focus on the disparities in women's health. We know that although women in the UK on average live longer than men, they spend a significantly greater proportion of their lives in ill health and disability when compared with men. But even amongst women, there are marked disparities. And our strategy shows our plan to give targeted support to the groups who face barriers accessing the care they need, for example, disabled women and women experiencing homelessness. It also shows how we are putting an extra £10 million of funding towards 25 new mobile breast screening units that will target areas and communities with the greatest challenges around uptake and coverage. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, as well as these cross-cutting priorities, the response to our call for evidence also highlighted a number of specific areas where targeted action is needed. These include fertility care, where we will be removing barriers that restrict access that are not health-based, but based, for example, on whether someone has had a child from a previous relationship, and make access to facility services much more transparent. Another of our priority areas is to improve care for women and their partners who experience the tragedy of pregnancy loss. At the moment, although parents whose babies are stillborn must legally register the stillbirth, if a pregnancy ends before 24 weeks gestation, there is no formal process for parents to legally register their baby, which I know can be distressing for many bereaved parents. So we will be accepting the interim update to the Independent Pregnancy Loss Review and introducing a voluntary scheme to allow parents who have experienced a loss before 24 weeks of pregnancy to record and receive a certificate to provide recognition of their tragic loss. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a significant programme of work, but we cannot achieve the scale of change that we need through central government alone. We must work across all areas of health and care. We will need the NHS, the local authority commissioners, to expand the use of women's health hubs, the medical schools, regulators and royal colleges to help us improve education and training for healthcare professionals, the National Institute for Health and Care Research to help make breakthroughs that will drive our future work, and many others to play their part too. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to finish by thanking everyone involved in the development of this important strategy, including the Minister of State for Health, who is on the front bench with me today, for her determination that she has shown in taking this strategy forward. I'd also like to pay tribute to my predecessors, the Honourable Members, Right Honourable Members for West Suffolk and Bromsgrove. I know my right honourable friend is in his place for their commitment to this important issue even before, even during rather, uh, the pressures of the pandemic. This is a landmark strategy that lays the foundation for change and helps us to tackle the injustices that have persisted for too long. I commend this statement to the House. Thank you. Where's Streeting? Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I begin by um, thanking the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement and, and add my thanks to, to the Minister for her work, his predecessor, the former Secretary of State um, who sat opposite, and of course officials in the Department for the work that they have done. I'm genuinely glad that this work is out of the door when so much else has been in hiatus because of the um, wider political change afoot in government. And can I also join him in recognising the campaigning efforts of his constituent, Kath Sampson, as well as the efforts of my honourable friend, the member for Swansea East, who's campaigned tirelessly to raise awareness of the menopause and has been a driving force for change on behalf of women everywhere. For too long, Madam Deputy Speaker, women's health has been an afterthought, and the voices of women have been at best ignored and at worst silenced. 
four out of five women who responded to the government survey could remember a time when they didn't feel listened to by a healthcare professional, and that has simply got to change. In recent years, we've seen a string of healthcare scandals primarily affecting women. Nearly 2,000 reported cases of avoidable harm and death in maternity services at Shrewsbury and Telford. More than 1,000 women operated on unnecessarily by the rogue breast surgeon Ian Patterson. Thousands given faulty PIP breast implants and many left with traumatic complications after vaginal mesh surgery. Meanwhile, every woman who needs to use the NHS today faces record high waiting times. The NHS is losing midwives faster than it can recruit them. Gynaecology waiting lists have grown faster than any other medical speciality. The number of women having cervical screening is falling, and black women are 40% more likely to experience a miscarriage than white women. This is the cost for women of 12 years of conservative mismanagement. And so I want to address each part of the strategy in turn. The strategy promises new research, which is, of course, important. Studies suggest that gender biases in clinical trials are contributing to worse health outcomes for women. There is evidence that the impact of women-specific health conditions, such as heavy menstrual bleeding, endometriosis, pregnancy-related issues, and the menopause, is overlooked. So, of course, what the Secretary of State has said today about improving data is so important. But can he also set out how exactly the government intends to make use of this new data to improve outcomes for women? Improving the education and training of health professionals is absolutely essential, because when they don't, there are consequences. Almost one in ten women have to see their GP ten times before they can get proper help and advice about the menopause. And half of medical schools aren't teaching doctors about menopause when it affects every woman. So can I, alongside the, uh, the, the, the proposal that the Secretary of State's outlined for training incoming medical students and incoming doctors, challenge him to go further? Because what plans does the government have for clinicians who are already practising? We need to upskill the existing workforce, not just the incoming workforce. And let's be clear, informing clinicians is no good if we don't also improve access to HRT. So where is the action in this strategy to end the postcode lottery for treatment we currently have? Turning to breast cancer, it's the most common type of cancer in the UK, and the NHS offers regular breast cancer screening to women aged between 50 and 70, which can prevent avoidable deaths by identifying cancer early when it is more treatable and survival is more likely. Yet fewer women in the most deprived areas receive regular breast screening than those in the most affluent areas. Even before the pandemic, too many women with suspected breast cancer were waiting more than the recommended two weeks to be seen by a specialist. So can the Secretary of State tell me how the programme announced today is going to make a difference to outcomes for patients if, once diagnosed, they just end up on a waiting list that's far too long and can't access the treatment they need? Uh, I do welcome what the Secretary of State has said about removing barriers to IVF for women in same-sex couples, which we welcome. For far too long, they've faced unnecessary obstacles to accessing IVF for no other reason than the fact they love another woman, and it's high time we put this right. And I do also want to mention endometriosis. Tens of thousands of women provided testimony to the government about the issues they face surrounding diagnosis and treatment. So can the Secretary of State give the House assurances that every woman who is treated for this disease will have equal access to specialist services for day one and to make sure women don't have to fight to get the diagnosis in the first place? And on polycystic ovary syndrome, Madam Deputy Speaker, what is the Secretary of State going to do to make sure that we equalise access to a range of treatments, not least for women for whom the pill is simply inappropriate, to make sure we end the division between those who receive a prescription on the NHS and those who go privately receiving better treatment. I also want to raise some points about what hasn't been mentioned today. As well as the appalling figures on black maternity deaths, a quarter of black women surveyed a five, by five more times felt that they received a poor or very poor standard of care during pregnancy, labour and their postnatal care too. Women who live in deprived areas are more likely to suffer a stillbirth than their richer counterparts. My honourable friend, the Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities, has pledged a new Race Equality Act to tackle the structural inequalities in our society, including healthcare. But we have a government that's more interested in stoking culture wars than acknowledging these inequalities even exist. Surely that has got to change with new leadership in the party opposite. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, 
The reality that faces women in this country is this. Breast cancer waiting times are through the floor. Half a million women are waiting for gynaecology treatment. Black women are four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth, and too many still can't get HRT when they need it. This strategy simply will not solve the depth of the crisis in women's health care after 12 years of Conservative man mismanagement. And every day this Conservative government remains in office is another day where women will have to wait far too long for the care they desperately need. Such a judge. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, I really I think it's probably a good idea if I allow the Secretary of State to answer the Shadow Secretary of State. I'm too many steps ahead. Secretary of State. I, I didn't want, I didn't want 